Hello, everyone. Welcome to Real Vision Live. For Real Vision, I'm Max Wheatley. I'm joined today by Peter Brandt, who's making his return to Real Vision after I don't know how many appearances now. Uh, Peter, if you if you haven't heard of him, which I, I can't believe, uh, he, he's the president and founder of, of Factor Trading, um, and he can be found on Twitter at, at what is your handle these days, Peter? Uh, Peter L. Brandt, at Peter L. Brandt. Yeah, well, Peter is extremely generous with his uh, thoughts on Twitter, and, and you can find him there with lots of great charts. We're going to go through about 15 charts today, and I, and I know people will have some questions. So I want to jump right into them, Peter. Uh, let's, let's start with, with the euro currency. Uh, yeah, and hey, by the way, it's always great being on Real Vision. I love Real Vision, and it's just uh, you, you guys have something special. It's always always great for me to be part of it. But if we're talking the euro currency. There, there's a couple things that I see that I just want to point out without this, you know, and maybe I can be lucky enough to sidestep a prediction, but at least kind of point out some things that that people should be aware of. Uh, I, I mean, the main thing to me is, you know, we've been up since last March in the euro currency against the dollar. And we are now building into the market the fact that we have historically large commercial short positions. The commercials are short. Now, some of that's hedging. But the big boys, the big companies, the big trading operations, commercials are short. And the euro currencies, speculators are long. Now, that doesn't mean that automatically you come to a bearish conclusion and you just assume that uh, specs eventually are going to be wrong. Commercials are always right because they can hold their position. But basically, it's pretty dangerous to bet against commercials in, in favor of specs when we have historic extremes and commitments of traders. That's where we are right now. Commercials have loaded up on the short side of the euro currency. Uh, you know, despite the fact, you know, during this rally we've had since March. And so that leads me to say, OK, maybe not all is well in euro currency land that we have to start thinking about the fact that we're going to see some liquidation. We're going to see some squaring of positions that will put downward pressure, especially now that maybe we have interest rates uh, heading back up. The, the other thing to consider is uh uh, on the other side of the coin, it, well, on the same side of the coin, is the world is always short dollars. I mean, the world financial system always sits in a short dollar position. And so if you see a turn in the dollar back up, because the U.S. dollar is now back uh, testing the, uh, I think it was the February 2018 low. So it's a good point for the U.S. dollar to find support where it is right now. So we have the U.S. dollar back into a very strong area of support on its longer term charts. We have the euro currency, which has been rallying since March. And in light of that, we have big commercial shorts in the euro currency, historic long positions on the part of the specs. We have historic long positions in the U.S. dollar index by commercials, historic shorts by specs in the U.S. dollar uh, and so we may be finding the fact that there is an historic tendency for the euro currency to either find a top or a bottom in January, the first two weeks of February. I've talked about that uh, almost yearly, in fact. On, on yeah. real, it's been my privilege to talk about what I call the January effect in the euro currency, the tendency to have a... What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just one dollar, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description Go to realvision.com and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. About that, uh, almost yearly, in fact, on, on yeah. real, it's been my privilege to talk about what I call the January effect in the euro currency, the tendency to have a major turn or you know, a major lower, major uh, high in the month of January, first two weeks of February. 
So I'm thinking that's what I kind of want to be geared to right now as a trader. It's way too late, I think, to be short the dollar and long the euro currency. We're late in the game. That's a trade that's worked for 10 months. Uh, time to really start uh, looking for opportunities going the other way. On the euro currency, you know, we could go back to last year's lows. There's a major 50-year trend line that we bounced off of last in March in the euro currency. So we had back there. So that's what I'm thinking in euro currency. Just in terms of the charts, when we look at euro currency is, hey, uh, maybe it's time to start scoping out a short position, at least to be aware of it. Uh, and so that that's kind of where I am as a trader. I'm thinking I, I want to look for a shorting opportunity in euro currencies, a buying opportunity in the U.S. dollar index. OK, so I have here the, the long term chart that goes back into the 70s, really actually before the euro existed. So uh, for anybody who's confused to see a, a, you know, a 1970s euro, why don't you explain what that is? And then we have that long trend line. And then I want to go through through that second euro chart, too, just specifically. Uh, yeah, well, you know, sure, the, the euro currency hasn't been around 50 years. That's the first thing people say. But what we do here is we have that chart that can go back because prior to the euro currency, what we do as a proxy is take the trade weighted basket of the European currencies that's, that existed at the time, French franc, Deutsche Mark, Italian lira, and so forth. And we create a proxy uh, that really pre-existed the euro. And therefore, we can create a chart that goes back into the 70s. And, and that's what we have there. And so uh, that's how we create that chart, Max. And so that's where we get a 50-year trend line. Okay. And then we have the, the, the euro futures, a little bit shorter term chart here. Um, you know, what, are, what are you seeing in this chart? Well, I, I mean, it's possible to look and say we have a six-year continuation head and shoulders top, and I think that's the chart you're 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 looking yeah. at. It is that we take the price action at the over the last six years, and we say this looks strangely like a head and shoulders top. You know, it could come to be. I, I mean, I, the question I asked some very very sharp macro traders today is how do you get an 80 cent euro currency? Their answer to that is you have to break up the euro. You have to break, you have to break it up. I mean, you have to have Italy or you have to have Spain collapse and pull out of the euro currency. You start doing that, you crumble the euro currency and that's probably the only way it takes place. And so, you know, might that big six your head and shoulders in the euro currency come to pass? Probably not, but you can create a macro scenario where it could. Okay. And then, so with that in mind, when you think about if somebody does want to, you know, take a, a short position in, in the euro, what are the, the ranges that you could see? Well, I, I mean, I think we're, we're nearing the top end range now, but I mean, for right now, that trend line comes in, you know, dollar uh, five, something like that. But I mean, when you go back really over history, the euro currency, even though we had a big move last year, is in really a rather dull, narrow range relative to what has happened over the last 20 years, let's say. And so it's been pretty tame. It's been, you know, so, you know, to talk about maybe we have 15 cents on the downside of the euro, you know, that's, that's you know, that's a big, it seems like a big percentage. But if you look at the euro currency trading, really going back into the 70s and the 80s, well, you, you, you'll go back on the proxy back into the 70s. But over the last 20 years, you know, 15 cent range in the euro currency it, it does not really take it into wild and crazy territory. Yeah. And then moving on to just this this chart of the dollar here, often, you know, they're kind of when you talk about being long euro, your short dollar, because the dollar index is made up so much of the euro. Um, but but there are other aspects in there. So just to focus specifically on this chart of the dollar. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the chart of the dollar, uh, you know, basically, we're back and we're holding that February 2018 low, you know, right around 88.15. And uh, you know, here's my comment. I don't know if I can name 
somebody who is not bearish the U.S. dollar. I mean, my experience as a trader is when you get an idea that has such con- you know conventional, uh, it it becomes r- really gospel. You go out, and, you know, it's really easy to say the dollar is going to dump. The U.S. the U.S. Fed continues to print money. You know, the U.S. dollar is garbage. The U.S. dollar is worthless. The U.S. dollar goes down. The U.S. dollar is bearish, and so forth. You know, the social media is filled with dollar bears. I mean, you cannot find a dollar bull. I mean, you can in real vision. You can find, you know, certainly from time to time, Raul has certainly been a dollar bull. Uh, you know, at least he likes to drift there. But, you know, he's a flexible trader. But generally speaking, um, when you look when you look out into social media, all you see is the dollar is garbage. And yet you have historic long positions in the dollar index by commercials. You're down in an area of very, very strong historical support. And you basically have the world banking system and world commerce system short dollars in a short dollar position. And so you you can create a, a scenario that if we start to see the daily chart bottoming down in this area, be on the alert. Perhaps you know we've got a long trade coming in the dollar. I mean, I'm not. I'm not long. I'm not short the euro currency. I'm not long the dollar. But that's kind of what I what I smell as a scent that's that's coming into the air. Okay. Well, here's a scent that is definitely in the air, but has not received nearly as much attention as as, as the euro and the dollar, other currencies. Uh, or you know, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin that everybody's talking about now is the Nikkei. The Nikkei just had a massive breakout that uh, of a god what is that a, a 30 year range yeah a 30 year range you know i i tell you everything i look at um in terms of financial markets in terms of stock markets i can't find a stock market that's not been on this big tear and is either at all-time record highs or close to record highs you look at what's happened and we'll talk in a little bit about the s p's u.s market other markets, and it's easy to forget that the Japanese stock market's all-time high was in 1989. That's 31 years ago. You know, we were in a bear market for decades in the Japanese market. You know, you can't find another market that can say it's, you know, it's all-time high was 30 years ago. You know, especially a strong economy, a viable economy like Japan. And so we created this mass of what I call a bowl or a base in the Nikkei Dao. We've broken out decisively. I, I think we run back. We run back to that, you know, the, the all-time highs at least in the Nikkei. So we had back to 39,000, which was the high we made uh, 31 years ago. So, uh, you know, I'm long the Nikkei. I, I trade the Nikkei through Osaka. So I trade Osaka Futures. That's my position. I, it's one of those. I like that story, and I'm sticking with it. Uh, I mean, I think we are in a, a a multi-year bull trend, and we have been in a multi-year bull trend. But part of that bull trend was still down in the base. It was still down in the bowl of the chart, and so we blasted off. And uh, and and so I think we go to at least new all-time highs in the Nikkei. Probably go much higher than that. And so uh, I, I like Japan. I like the Japan indexes. I like individual stocks over in Japan. Sony, Toyota, you can go stock after stock. You can find many, many individual stocks over in Japan that, that really are now entering bull market territories. So I like Japan. Uh, I'm way overweighted in Japan. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, the Nikkei has broken out as well. We have Chinese equities as as breaking out. So there is some some strong bullish trends in in Asia. Uh, are you as bullish on China as you are on Japan? Yeah, it's, China is such an interesting story. For years, I have been saying, you know, you had the 1800s, 1700s were the centuries of Western Europe. Then we had 1800s, 1900s, the centuries of North America, that we are entering a century of Asia. And people want to dispute that. People want to argue that. Well, you can argue it all you want, but just look at the facts. You have strong economies over there. 
you go over to Asian countries, you see modern cities. Uh, people want to argue against China and say, oh, you can't trust their numbers. They're corrupt. It's, you know, the whole thing shaky. The reality is, I think, you know, China, China is going to emerge here and be recognized as the strongest economy in the world. You look at the Chinese, and I, I trade the China A50. Uh, that's the futures contract that I trade. Uh, that's traded in Singapore. I like it. I'm long it. I'm overweighted it. I think China's got a long way to go. It's broken out of this massive ascending triangle on the charts, multi-year ascending triangle. The ascending triangle is a powerful pattern. Uh, it, it's really one of the most powerful patterns. And so we're, we're really early. We're early in the bull market in China have a long way to go in China. I think the A50 goes, I mean, the first target's 21,000, but I, I mean, I think we start there. And so uh, I like China, I like the A50, I like the Chinese economy. Sure, their numbers may be corrupt, but I, I think time will prove that they're well poised and you can get into the whole politics of Chinese trade and all of that. But I, I think people who are long China will be well served. Okay. Um, we did get a question on, on the Nikkei. Vincent asks, who will buy the Nikkei ETFs if the central bank starts selling? My response would be, what, what's going to make them start selling? Yeah, I, I mean, of course, what, what you've done is, in effect, federalize the stock market in, in, in Japan, right? I, I mean... It's been their way of kind of monetizing their debt is just to own all of their stocks. Um, you know, and, and there'll be a point where maybe they have to sell stock markets. They, you know, you look at the demographics of, of, of Japan and, you know, it's getting older. But um, I look at the charts and I go, it's not going to happen right now. It's not going to happen in this trade. And, uh, you know, may it happen down the road? Yes. But as a trader, I want to respond. I don't want to I don't want to get way out in front of myself and look at the strong trend and the reason to be long the market and doubt myself based on conjecture. And uh, the whole idea of Japan's central bank uh, selling that I, that's conjecture at this point in time. It's not happening. Yeah, well, and in a sort of don't fight the Fed way, it's more of a bull argument than a bear argument. It's that oh, you have it sure the central, is. Yeah, the central bank buying. Well, I, I want to go to an old favorite of yours. I know it's something you've probably been trading longer than almost anything else, corn. So corn has, has broken out, and it has been talked about really as evidence that, that the inflation trend is real and that it's kicking in. So I, I want to get just a pure chartist view from you on what you're seeing here with corn, but also are you buying ag commodities as signaling the coming inflation, or is this more you know supply, supply disruption that, that we're seeing work its way out in prices, but short-term stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a, an inflation story to be told, Max. Let me let me explain to people how I look at it. I started at the Chicago Board of Trade as a corn trader in 1975. You, you look at the price of just about everything else in the world. Corn right now is priced where it was in 1975. Even though we've had a big run up, I traded corn in 1975, 1976 at current prices. That's not adjusted for inflation. And so, relatively speaking, agricultural prices have gone nowhere. They are right where they were in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s. Now, the tendency of raw material markets is you have bull markets and you collapse. Yeah, you know, it's like popcorn. It bounces up to the top of the kettle and then goes right back down to the bottom of the pan. And so you have popcorn markets and the egg markets. But from time to time, you kind of have a whole reevaluation of price structure. You know, in the 19, early 1970s, we had a bull market in agricultural goods, and it took prices to a whole new level from where it was in the 50s and the 60s. That may be happening again. I mean, we've come out of a, a magnificent rectangle base in corn that I, I think brings markets up. But the story in, the, in agriculture, at least right now, is supply and demand. 
you know, it's supply pressures coming out of South America, it's demand pressures coming out of Asia. It's not really an inflationary story. It could become an inflationary story, but right now it's a pure supply and demand fundamental story that what happens in the grain markets is you renew your fundamentals. Your fundamentals change in effect every year because you put a new crop in the ground, you have a new crop, you have a whole new set of supply and demand statistics that you look at, but we're in a crop year that does not end for another 10 months. And we have 10 months to get through. And the pricing mechanism of grains is to assure that there is crop left in the pipeline, that we don't run out of grain, that there's enough grain to fill the pipeline, uh, to keep elevators at least somewhat full, to keep supply going to users, to keep supply going to uh, uh, hog farmers, cattle farmers, into the export channels. And price performs that mechanism. Price will, in effect, uh, 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 be the governor that, that we do not run out of grains. That's what's happening in the corn market. At what price does that happen? I don't know. But we don't even have a corn crop in the ground right now. Well, what happens if we, have, if we have weather problems this year? Uh, I mean, there is a whole lot that can happen between now and the time that we bring another corn crop in out of the field in October, November. And so yeah, I, I look at that and say, buy the dips, buy the big dips. Uh, could we become an inflation story in raw materials down the road and take all grains to a whole new level and create a whole new price zone for grains down the way? That could happen. But for right now, it's, it's, it's a bull market. It's based on fundamentals. We have a lot of crop year left. We have a lot of weather to get through. We haven't even put a corn crop in the ground. The dips have to be bought. Uh, the grain prices are down today. Beans have been down close to 30 cents. Uh, corn's breaking. You know, but you buy 30 cent breaks in corn. Okay. Yeah, I think that's really interesting what you're saying about how it could become inflation. So it's that reevaluation that could come from just a, a hard year that might push the industry and, and really the market in general to rethink where, you know, the, the investment that's being put into ags at the moment. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I, I mean, you also, you look at the price of equities relative to real things. Uh, whether it be copper, gold, cr oh, yeah, look at crude oil. Maybe we'll talk about crude oil. Yeah, we'll talk but about. If you look at the price of raw materials versus equities, it's way out of whack. Uh, I mean, I mean, at the as an asset, stock prices you just can hardly justify where they're at relative to the real things in the world. And we've seen that cycle in the past, where 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 really you go through a period where real goods, where real items, things that really exist appreciate and value against uh, uh, assets like stocks. And we could we could be entering a period like that again. I mean, uh, over the years, I remember uh, way back when people would look at the price of equities versus wheat or how many bushels of corn does it take to buy a Dow point and things like that. And if you look over time, that's very cyclical. And so we could be entering a period where, where markets like soybeans, like corn, like cattle, like gold, like silver, and so forth, will go through an appreciation against other asset classes. Yeah. Well, you know, you never know though when those when those metrics change over time. I I used to look at the old like '30s edition of securities analysis, and they priced the stock market in price to to dividend. And unless that ratio or is, a, is in an 80-year cycle, it hasn't really mattered for 80 years. So these things do you know, come and go and fall out of favor, and, and it, it's always a question of, of how long the cyclicality will last, uh, because some, sometimes things, things do change. I, I'm leaning towards you that, that I think this one will, will probably have another cycle, but uh, I always worry that, that maybe things have changed. I mean, look at, look at the importance placed on, on technology in the world today, and and that, that really fits into that cycle. And so there is a, a, a narrative that can be put into the, the argument that this cycle won't repeat. And, and we do, uh, you innovate over time. It gets easier to pull things out of the ground. We're going to get better at growing corn probably uh, as, 
as technology improves and whatnot. And so, you know, maybe it makes sense why corn is, is not, is, is at the same price it was in the seventies. Cause we've gotten so much better at producing corn than where we were in the seventies. Well, you know, that brings up a really interesting point because, and I'm going to switch over to another market. Then I'll come back to corn. Yeah. As you hear people say silver prices can't be where they're at because the cost of production is X. Uh, you hear that story all the time to that. I say that's nonsense. Because historically, raw material, silver's a raw material, corn's a raw material, end up getting priced at the cost of the at, at the cost of production of the most efficient producers, not the average producers, not the silver mine that's marginal, not the corn farmer that's marginal. It's the corn farmer that's the most efficient. It's the silver mine that's most efficient. It it's that's how it works. And over time, of course. The efficiency in producing corn, you know, corn yields today are far, far higher than they were 40 years ago, 45 years ago when I started. It's a whole different world. The, the way people farm, it's a whole different world. The hybrids they grow, it's a whole different world. So, you know, to that extent, yeah. I, I mean, raw materials tend to sloop back down, slump back down to the cost of the most efficient producers. That's what's happening. But nevertheless, corn, you know, farmers will tell you, even efficient farmers, that they've been losing money on their corn. They've been making money on their dirt, but they've been losing money on their corn. And so, you know, maybe we'll go back through a period where farmers really start making money on the on their production itself. Okay. All right. Well, let, let's go on to, to Bitcoin here, and we can come back to some commodities later. Um, so we have the, the big you know, it's a long-term chart for Bitcoin, less than less than 10 years. Um, but, but the chart with all the different parabolic advances on there, I see you have marked uh, the, the current one we're in right now. Um, you know, what are your views on Bitcoin? I'm sure everybody is interested here. Yeah, what a crazy market. Uh, I mean, uh, I almost pinched myself when to think that, you know, I'm still trading as an old guy and I was privileged enough to have uh, the, the first big major bull markets in grains and metals at the front end of my career. And now I get this crazy Bitcoin market, you know, as the book end on the other end. How how crazy is that? that you know, I, here I'm in my mid 70s and I'm, you know, involved in a market like Bitcoin, uh, which, by the way, is fascinating because I was alerted to Bitcoin by Raul Paul, who in 2016 sent me a chart of Bitcoin by email and said, Peter, what do you think? And at that point, you know, I'd heard people talking about Bitcoin. I didn't know what it was. I, I just thought, you know, it's just some computer money that's out there floating around. And so Raul sent me this chart. And one look at this chart, I bought, you know, I went, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Is this just classically a beautiful chart? And I, you know, I didn't even know how to buy Bitcoin back then. Raul yeah. had to line me up with, with the, the exchange that he was using at the time. It's still the exchange that, uh, that I opened an account with in March of 2016 at Raul's introduction. Uh, but, you know, the, the chart that you're looking at shows that we're in the third parabolic advance. And really, if you go back prior to that, you know, to the to the initial to the inception of Bitcoin through what you show as the first parabolic advance, there was another parabolic advance. So we're really in the fourth parabolic advance, which is amazing because that chart is a log chart. It is hard to find a single parabolic advance on a you know on an arithmetic chart in most markets. And here we have parabolic advances on a log chart, and we have the fourth one. Uh, I mean, this this is history. I mean, this this does not happen in normal markets. And so, you know, right now, parabolic advances have tended to be pretty reliable in Bitcoin. It's a horse that's, you know, at least one placed or showed. And so it's a horse worth betting on. And, you know, you look at the Bitcoin chart and from the December 2017 highs, uh, back until September of last year, we formed this massive symmetrical triangle, what we call a symmetrical triangle or coil uh, on the chart. And then we, we, we broke out of that uh, last year and then we kind of retested 
the upper boundary of that in August, September, and then we roll back up. And of course, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Yeah. And so, you know, we're in a strong bull market in Bitcoin. I, I am fully long Bitcoin. As a matter of fact, it's my single largest holding uh, w w within what I do. Uh, yeah, I own more stocks in value than Bitcoin, but I'm talking about individual stocks. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm I'm fully committed uh, to Bitcoin. I like Bitcoin. Uh, I think the burden of proof in Bitcoin is going to be on the bears. I mean, you, you look at social media and Bitcoin gets bashed and it gets trashed and it's going to zero and uh, and so forth. And you've got you've got governments. Uh, a challenging tether, which is a whole another story. But, you know, so you, you have people who go out there and create the narratives for Bitcoin to, to roll over and die. I think the burden of proof is on that. I mean, right now you, you have, uh, you have very strong ownership of Bitcoin. I, I mean, people have pointed out if every millionaire in the world owned one Bitcoin, there's not enough Bitcoins to go around. That's a true statement. And so, you know, the bet here, of course, for the bears that Bitcoin's just a big joke. It is this, you know, it's, it's the beanie baby pet rock of the 2020s. Uh, you know, that remains to be seen. But the narrative for the bull is it's a true store of value. It's a true means for settling uh, global, international global commerce, that it's the real thing that it will some degree become a global currency, global reserve currency. That is the currency of the people, not the currency of a Fed. I mean, that's the bull narrative. And I think there's something to that bull narrative, quite frankly. Max, I think that there's something real to that. And especially when I combine that, look at the history of the chart, look how chart construction is put together, and even watch the way that this market has rallied. This, that the, this has been a unique, fun market to watch as it's gone up here because it hasn't gone up on what people traditionally call FOMO. It's the fools rushing in and buying the strength. If you, if you look at the ladder, the bid offer ladder is a Bitcoin. It hasn't gone up by bids chasing the market. It's gone up every time somebody puts an offer out there on the table. It's just quietly consumed. And, and so it's gone up by buyers just taking offers out the table. That's the nature of the bull move. And when you see that, when I've seen that in all other markets, usually it's very constructive. Now, here, here's, here's the caveat in Bitcoin, is when you look at the 2015 to 2017 bull market, we had nine corrections of 30% or more. Actually, they averaged right around the mid 30s, you know, between 32 and 38, 39%. You know, this current bull market, when you take it from the March low of last year, we had that kind of washout, COVID washout low, and you take it from that point, we've had two corrections of 20% only and a few corrections of 10%. So we haven't had like the traditional 30% correction in Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not predicting it's going to happen, but it could happen. I mean, it would be certainly natural for it to happen. And so uh, I think those who are not in Bitcoin and they're wondering, how do you get in Bitcoin? Well, you know, we recently had a 20% correction. Now, if we go down and we take out these recent lows, it's going to be more than a 20% correction. And so, you know, might we then approach a 30% correction? Could. And so, again, I think the burden of proof are on those people who want to claim that Bitcoin's a beanie baby uh, pet rock. Uh, but I'll, I'll accept the narrative that there is hope that Bitcoin can become some form of global reserve currency or at least a basket in a new world order combined with gold, crude oil, whatever, becomes a special drawing rights and, in effect, gets collateralized as a recognized currency. So, you know, for right now, I want to remain long. Uh, you know, a 20% correction didn't blow me out. I don't think a 30% correction is going to do much damage to me. And I, I think there's strong, there's strong support underneath the market. You're starting to see 
commercial interest being willing to hold Bitcoin as an asset. When you start to see Fortune 500 companies list in their annual report a line item, and instead of cash equivalencies, they list cryptos, crypto will have, a, will have arrived at that point. Once we get to that point, people who are declaring crypto to be dead meat will be proven wrong. Okay. Well, I, I don't think we have time here to, to debate the, the narrative or the fundamentals, but I do have questions about trading parabolic advances. Um, so we, we got a question from Barris who said about timing parabolic markets. Is there any way to time them or at least, you know, how do you approach uh, parabolic advances as a trader? I mean, hey, it, it's like a rocket, right? You strap yourself into a rocket. Uh, you strap yourself into a rocket. It's not a, it's not a calm ride. Uh, I mean, it's, it's white knuckle. This is white knuckle flying. And the, the reality is that eventually you will break a dominant parabolic. You know, parabolic, parabolics have the tendency to morph a little bit. You can draw a parabolic advance on the, on the daily chart in Bitcoin, but there's a longer parabolic advance, which I think is the dominant parabolic advance on the weekly chart. That's the one that's going to hold. We're a long way from retesting that parabolic support, a long way. I mean, there you have a 40% correction to do that. And so... But the reality is, like in 2017, we knew what the parabola, we knew where it was drawn. And once you break a, para, a parabola, you usually get an 80, at least an 80% correction. The previous three parabolic advances in Bitcoin all corrected 80% plus. Eventually, we will correct 80% plus in this parabolic advance. Maybe it's from 150,000, I don't know, or 100,000, I don't know. Uh, but eventually you will correct it. But in the meanwhile, you know, you don't use the parabola as your stop loss. I'll tell you that because, you know, by the time a parabolic advance is broken, usually you've already had a 40 to 50 percent correction. So you've given back half your money by the time you can say, wow, we're in trouble. And so, you, you know, a trader just has to be alert Hey, I have no problem taking profits on the way up in a trade, putting you know cash in the market. I created an account to become involved in Bitcoin. I have taken profits so that I have completely covered my initial investment in Bitcoin. I'm playing with house money, and I'm willing to take a risk and give the market room on house money. I've reclaimed my investment. And, you know, if we get up to, let's say, 50,000, I will take a little bit more off. So I don't want to be chasing rallies here. You know, I, I, I want to be I want to be you know, be wise, have a base holding, which in my mind is about a third to a half of what I own now. And, you know, be willing to ride that back to zero. Yep. And so I think that's how he, that's how one has to approach this is really it's a change in mentality. You know, here in the U.S., the, largely we have measured our wealth in U.S. dollars. You know, how much you worth? You explain to somebody it has a dollar sign on it. It is your base, right? You, ret you buy stocks, you return to your base. You buy real estate, you return to your base currency. Well, if, if the narrative is correct, Bitcoin becomes someone's base currency. So if, let's say in the case of X, Y generations who have made that mental change, that they're not going to measure their net worth in terms of dollars, that they've made a generational change that Bitcoin is their currency. What do they care that Bitcoin goes down? You know, it doesn't matter that Bitcoin goes down. That's their base currency. That's their home currency. And so they're not worried about what Bitcoin is doing against the dollar because Bitcoin is their home currency. It's how they measure themselves. It's where they want their wealth. Where do you want your wealth? A farmer wants his wealth in land and dirt. They measure their, their value acreage. by dirt. Acreage, yeah. He's, he's got a lot acreage. of acreage. Yeah. A real estate guy measures his net worth by... You know, uh, commercial buildings, number of floors, number of square feet. Yeah, square feet. Yeah. So why can't you measure your your net worth in bitcoins? Periodically, you take a chance and you you know you sell your bitcoins against ether, but then you come back to your base currency again because it's how you measure yourself. 
And so uh, I'm not there. At my age, I'm probably not going to make that leap. But I see the narrative. I see the mentality that somebody can have to be there. All right. Well, I, I'm I'm a, a different generation. I'm not quite there either. Um, uh, but but I want to move on, on to gold. So we have a chart here uh, of gold. Um, it looks like it's gold futures. And, and you say in parentheses, you know, with the cost of rolls. So you're rolling the, the futures and taking that out here in price. Now, what are you seeing in gold? We had a big, big breakout earlier in 2020, and uh, it, it has not been not been fun for for gold bulls over the last few months. Yeah, I mean, gold's gone higher, of course. I mean, you, you, you look at where it was in, you know, uh, June, July of 2019. We've you know, we've we've had a big run in gold. Uh, we've made new all time highs in gold. Depends on how you measure the cost of the roll and so forth. But, you know, the trend's up. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not in gold right now, but my inclination is to want to be a gold buyer, to be a buyer. I want to be long gold. Uh, I don't want to be short gold. Now, you get into the whole subject of is gold a store of value, gold versus Bitcoin. Uh, you, you know, we can get into that whole debate. I'd rather not get into that debate. My mind, gold is a commodity. You know, it's, it's silver's a commodity, gold's a commodity, soybeans a commodity, copper's a commodity, lumber's a commodity. And so I, I don't look at gold as my home currency. Some people look at gold as their home currency. Yeah. Right? I mean, if gold is how they measure everything. Uh, I'm not there. And I think history shows that you shouldn't be there. I mean, if you go back to the early 70s and measure it against the early 70s, uh, the annualized rate of return of holding gold is probably negative if you take out insurance and storage costs it's negative you haven't made any money uh you know if you hide if you bury it in your backyard maybe you can say you've annualized at five percent or six percent stock markets clean the clock on that one stocks have been a far better investment than gold and of course, Bitcoin's been a better investment in gold, but we're only talking about a ten-year, you know, duration there. So I don't think I don't look at gold as this something special, precious. You call it a precious metal. I, for me, it's something that you, you know, you get out of the ground, and if you go into the center of the earth uh, of, of this earth, there's more gold than would than anyone can own. And, you know, we're just scraping some of the gold that's come up through the cracks. And, you know, I, I think if somebody came here from another planet, intelligent being, they could not figure out why us human beings are going around thinking gold is something special. So, uh, but nevertheless, the trend's up. Uh, when the trend's up, I basically want to look for opportunities to own it. And that's where I'm in gold. We've had a good correction in gold. Um, there'll be an opportunity at some point, I think in the next year to own gold again and maybe, maybe pull out three, four hundred dollars an ounce. So uh, that, that's my attitude toward gold. All right. Uh, let's move on to, um, to oil. So we have, we have, uh, oil futures here and you can see that ridiculous move that we had when, when oil went negative. How, how does something like that screw up a chart? As a chartist, I got to ask, you know, how do you deal with, a commodity going negative? Does it just completely, you know, do you have to erase it from the chart? Can you, can yeah, you, you just, it? yeah, you just ignore it. I mean, I have people send me charts that have these big spindle spikes and say, how do, where do I draw a line from that? And I go, you don't even, it doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. I mean, we went to $45 on a fluke and it had to do with oil, oil deliverable oil and who could take it and who could deliver it. And it was a fluky deal. But even at $53, I mean, we may be as, as a world transitioning to renewables. And, you know, of course, there's a big, a big run in stocks on solar and so forth. And it's been a hot space. You know, people saying, you know, but, but here's the reality. I, 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 I'm not prepared to get on a jet plane with 300 other people and fly to Europe on a jet plane that just got solar panels up on the, uh, in, in windmills up on the top. Sorry, but I'll fly in planes that, that burn in jet fuel. And so, you know, we, we have a carbon-based energy system. Now, will we transition to more nuclear? Yes. Will we transition to solar? 
Yes. You look at, you know, you look at uh, the, the crazy story going on with electric cars, uh, Tesla, you know, unbelievable move in Tesla. You know, we, you know, we've got countries that have now announced a timetable, California, a timetable for, for basically getting rid, phasing out of uh, carbon-based automobile energy. And so, you know, we're going to see more of that, but there's still going to be a demand for energy. And here's the reality, as, as demand goes down, we're going to shut down marginal production at 53, 54, 55 gallons a barrel. If you, if you look at history, crude oil is cheap. Uh, we've got cheap crude oil. We're cutting off production like crazy. You know, up at eighty, ninety dollars. We're producing all kinds of crude oil from North Dakota. I mean, oil production in North Dakota. To think that the U.S. is a net exporting country of oil. Well, that can happen at a certain price, not at this price. And so you choke off, you choke off supply. And you know, I don't see the day, and perhaps tree huggers do that there's not such a thing as, bur as burning carbon. But uh, I think in my lifetime, and certainly yours, and certainly the lifetime of anybody who's alive right now, you know, carbon-based fuels are going to be a reality for certain uses. And so I think crude oil is cheap. I'm not long crude oil. I miss buying crude at minus 45. I couldn't have anyway, but, uh, or at 30. But, um, yeah, I think we'll see. I think we'll see seventy dollar crude before we see twenty five or thirty dollar crude again. Okay, all right. Well, uh, we will get into Tesla a little bit, um, but before we do that, let's talk about interest rates and and euro dollar futures that you have here. Yeah, I mean the chart of. I think the chart of. And keep in mind that's not euro currency, right? This is. Yeah, euro dollars are the interest rates of dollars that are being held offshore. They're dollars that are sitting in Europe. I mean, that's where we get it. Euro, it's euro dollars. It's dollars in Europe. And what's the interest rate? And it's really the equivalent of treasury bills, right? Yeah. We get treasury bill interest here. You get euro dollar interest, euro library interest in Europe and elsewhere. And so that's what that is. But if you look at that chart, basically, you can see that, you know, we've gone uh, to, to U.S. interest rates measured by euro dollars of zero. We, you know, we went to the world of zero, zero interest rate policy here in the U.S. Uh, that's where we took the short end of the yield curve here. Two-year notes, five-year notes, just about zero. We're not much above that. So you have to look at history. We had higher interest rates in the world in the 1960s, in the 1970s, or in the 1900s, in the 1800s, in the 1700s. These interest rates, we're going to go through a cycle where we're not going to see these interest rates again, at least in anybody's generation who's alive today. You, you know, it's crazy. You look at interest rates in Switzerland, minus 70 basis points, minus seven tenths of 1%. You want to own money. You want to hold money in, in Swiss francs? You pay the government for the privilege to do that. Same thing in a lot of European countries. It's a negative interest rate. You have negative interest rate policies. And so, you know, we've scraped the top. We're, we're not in the U.S. going to go into negative interest rate policies. Or if we do, it's going to be a flu. We're going to go to higher interest rates. I don't want to get into the inflation story. I just want to get into the fact that I don't think I don't think there's anything unhealthy about going into higher interest rates. Uh, I mean, I, I, I purchased a home. In 1983, at a 14% mortgage rate, and I didn't think anything of it at the time. I mean, I was I was I had money in T bills that was earning 17%, and so I mean that was unusual. That was the high in the yields. I mean that was the high in the cycle. So I just think that my mind right now is basically the game to lower rates is done. I mean that's over. We've had that trend. It, you know, it started in the early 1980s with a 40 year trend to zero interest rates in the U.S. That's done. We have to look forward. Uh, we're going to have a trend to higher rates. Now we'll probably get there. Uh, two step forwards, one step back, two step forwards, one step back. It's not going to be a huge surge, but we're going to get there. You know, my advice to young people 
who are can get these kind of mortgage rates right now is buy the most expensive home you can possibly afford. Take as much money out as you can possibly pay back and you'll be well served over time. Okay. All right. Well, I do want to let the audience know we got some questions that I just want to save to the end. Peter, can, can you do a little bit overtime today? Go a little longer than the hour? Yeah, we'll go, yeah we, we will. Always for real vision. You know that. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Peter. I do want to get through all these charts, though. So we have we have here the, the long-term chart of the S&P 500. And man, you cannot even see what happened in March of 2020 on this chart. No, I, I mean, I think that's a log chart. I think I'd give you a log chart, not you know, a lot of linear charts. So, yeah, yeah. Um, the trend has been up. Uh, I mean, you know, again, you, you, you go to Peter Schiff and say, tell me how gold has been such this great investment over stock. doesn't exist. I mean, stocks have been the place to be. Common stocks have been a fabulous investment for, for U.S. investors. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people in the U.S. who do not own common stocks. They may, of course, have retirement funds and pension funds and so forth, but it's been a great place to be. The, you know, we have these perma bears out there. All I want to do is talk about the top of the stock market. And, you know, hey, I can create a story with charts that does suggest that maybe we could be approaching this top. I mean, we're in the lofty territory here. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're into some high territory here, you know, and, and you can argue based on traditional valuations, you know, price versus PE, price versus sale, price versus uh, national debt. And you can create all of these global macro arguments that say the stock market couldn't be shouldn't be at the current level at the level it's at but the reality is we are at the level that we are at and common stocks have been a fabulous investment you know of course not all categories of stocks you know you look for for a number of years it was tech stocks it was a tech show uh, here more recently, we've seen small cap stocks uh, be on a tear. We've seen different category of stocks. We see alternative energy. We've seen, you know, of course, during COVID, things like Zoom, uh, you know, ways to pay bills online, all that sort of thing. We see that, but that's been the history of the stock market. You have a hot category, it cools off. Hot category, it cools off. The important thing is there's been rotation. And so we've seen rotation, you know, to a new thing that'll kind of be the lifeboat and carry the market until it solidifies. So I don't want to bet against the U.S. stock market. You know, I, here's the problem with that. And we talked about that a little bit in Bitcoin is when you say that you want a person says they want they're 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 super bearish to stock market. What they're really saying is they're super bulls in the dollar. Because you get out of the stock market, guess where your money goes? Goes into U.S. dollars. And so the stock market is a bet against the dollar. U.S. stocks are valued in an expression of U.S. dollars. And so anytime you buy stocks, you go short the dollars. Long stock, short dollars. You go short stocks, you're long dollars. Your best long dollars. And so, you, you know, there's two sides to this trade, and people have to remember that. For the time being, maybe there's a point at which there's a top of the stock market. I don't see it yet. Yes, it's stretched out. Yes, wants to be cautious. I'm about 55, 60% committed now in retirement money to U.S. common stocks. Uh, I, I mean, uh, and so that's where I'm at now. If someone wants to take the chart that they're seeing and create a bearish story about it, what you do is you say, we have a big broadening top. You know, big broadening top, you have a high, you have a low, you have a high, you have the low. One of the lows is the March 2019 low. And so you can create that. You can go back to Richard W. Schaubacher, 1934, technical analysis and stock market profits. You can go to 1948. John McGee, Robert Edwards, technical analysis and stock market trends. You can read all about broadening patterns. It is a classical pattern. It's a classical chart pattern. It's recognized by classical chartists 
as the real deal, as a real recognized pattern. And so we have that right now in the stock market. One could say, if stocks collapse from here, and let's say we have a 50% correction in stocks, you know, you're going to be able to look at the chart and say we topped with a broadening top. But the, a top's not a top until it's completed. You cannot declare a, a, a chart pattern to be a chart pattern until it's a chart pattern. Until it's a chart pattern with completion, it's only a possible chart pattern. And so you can't be bearish based on a broadening top because we don't have a broadening top yet. We have a possible broadening top. And so, you know, I don't want to predict markets. I want to respond to markets. I don't want to be a predictor. I don't want to take a chart and start drawing all kinds of fancy lines on the path that I see a market taking. I think that's a fool's game, quite frankly. You know, I want to, I want to know where a market is. I don't want to know where it's vulnerable. I want to know if I want to take the other side of my position. I want to know what that argument is from a classical charting point of view. For me, the argument is not P/E ratios. It's not price to sales. It's not all of that kind of stuff. Although, though, I'm not saying those things are illegitimate. I, I mean, you work for a guy who's brilliant in looking at markets, Raul. I mean, he has all my respect in the world. He and I may differ on how we view markets. We may differ 180 degrees. Yeah. Uh, but I, I respect that he comes to conclusions based on common sense and procedure. So if I were to say I'm going to become a stock market bear and start drawing lines into the future, I'd draw it based on the broadening top. It's not a broadening top yet. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be looking now. Quite frankly, based on instinct, and I got to tell you, my instincts are not the best. I, I mean, my strong convictions in a trade are not necessarily positively correlated with outcome. But my hunch is that we're going to see a big, broad trading range in U.S. equities in 2021. We had the big rip up from the March lows, you know, especially when you look at, look at NASDAQ, but even S&Ps, even Dow. You know, we've had the big run up. You know, is that sustainable? Is that sustainable as we transition to a new government? I kind of don't think so. Uh, you know, we're going to see tax law changes. We're going to see uncertainty of a new government. Uh, I think that, you know, those are fundamentals. Now, I trade on charts. I don't trade on them. So what I'm telling you is what I think could be the environment of the stock market in, in the coming year. And so kind of in the back of my crawl space here, I'm thinking, don't be a dogmatic bull in the U.S. stock market. Be cautioned. That doesn't mean I am not a long stocks like Micron, Johnson and Johnson, IBB, an ETF on healthcare. I'm going to be long things like that. Um, Cigna Insurance, looking to be long. I'm going to look at those opportunities, but in terms of the general market. I guess I'm kind of preparing to see a two-way market. Okay. Um, now, what about some of these rotations that, that have worked, the things that have been the lifeboats? Uh, you talked about solar and, and renewable energy as being a, a narrative that the market is clinging to, as well Tesla, a subset of that narrative, but perhaps a beast of its own uh, to, to even be separated again as, as, as its own narrative all in itself. Uh, you know, those have, have seen... Uh, you know, miniature parabolic advances this year. You know, when you look at this chart of Tesla, and we'll we'll take a look at Tan, the solar ETF, in just a second. You know, what are you seeing? And as as a chartist, you know, how do you trade that? Uh, luckily, there's been I'm a chartist, and so you know, I, I I trade patterns. You know, I trade setups. I'm a setup trader, and that's how I trade it. And luckily, in the case of Tesla. I cannot claim that, oh, I saw the story, I own Tesla. I mean, I, I've, I've seen YouTube videos that are fabulous. I know of people, younger people, that bought Tesla automobiles, absolutely believed in it, and put their life savings in Tesla stock four or five years ago and are now millionaires, Yet, you know, retired from working. Kudos. Congratulations. Yeah, I, I bow to you. That's brilliant. I love the story. I think those are those are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stories. And uh, but you know, I, I'm in and out. I'm a swing trader. 
And there luckily have been some really, really, really nice patterns in Tesla on the way up. There's been a couple. And yeah, there, I can really see those, those, little, those little pullbacks on the way up. Yeah, there have been. There's been some nice uh, places where a person's been, you know, I've been able to take out two, three hundred dollars here and then you get a split and, you know, you kind of start over again. You know, I haven't ridden the whole thing up, but, you know, I I, I kind of compare myself as a trader to American football. I know people from Europe aren't going to get this because they don't think American football is really football because you use your hands. But the, the reality is I, I play foot. I play football. My trading would be compared to playing football between the 30 yard lines. That's where I want to play my game. You know, not end zone to end zone. I don't want to run back 105 yard touchdowns. That's what's happened in Tesla. It's been a 120 yard touchdown. Back of the end zone to the back of the end zone. But um, they even extended the field and then the runner ran out of the stadium. But, you know, I'll, I'll take I'll take 30 yards in the cloud of dust. And so that's how I'll continue to trade it. But there's been a lot of naysayers. Elon Musk has had a lot of naysayers. And he's going to continue to have a lot of naysayers. But my contention from the very beginning was something somebody told me four or five years ago when they said, buy a Tesla and you won't be bearish the stock. Um, and I heard that. And I had more than one person tell me it's tough to own a Tesla car and be super bearish the stock. And the little things like that you hear from people you go, ah, 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 that means something. And I think that's what's happened. And, you know, people have looked at Tesla and said, oh, my goodness, how can the valuation of this car company, electric car company, be equal to the entire valuation of every other car company in the world? I've got a cuckoo clock going on. That's my ode to Germany. So in any case, I think the story is Tesla hasn't been a wait for cuckoo to be done. Tesla has not been a story of an electric car company. Tesla has been a story of energy, alternative energy, a whole way, new way to think about things is ushering in. It's kind of, you can say, you can say the same thing about, about Apple, you know, uh, t seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, you know, this is, this price is, is overvalued for a stupid telephone little thing you carry around that you talk on is overvalued. Well, good luck on that one. And so to a certain degree, you have the same thing. It's a legend. You have legendary stocks, you know, Walmart, McDonald's, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla. Uh, you have stocks like that. Goldman Sachs, they're legendary stocks. Tesla's joined that list. It's a legendary stock. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we may not have correction, but Tesla is just not an investment. You can't look at it and say, yeah, but they only sold so many cars this year. Well, until, until the rest of the market starts saying that, until the narrative that yeah. has been driving it has been violated. You know, there are some charts, though, like in Europe, the most, uh, the, the most mature electric vehicle market as a percentage of the cars that are sold if you if you look at that as as a as a symbol of what we can expect for the rest of the world tesla is no longer the dominant car being sold and people are noticing yep. and that that hasn't mattered to the market yet but as it starts to matter to people and as as people start to buy other electric vehicles it could change but it's really the narrative changing and the the market appreciating that narrative that is when it's going to play out in price and as of right now that's not a narrative that anybody really cares about and so until until that has been violated it sounds like you're going to be you're going to be buying dips yeah well i'm not going to be buying dips i'm going to be dying setups mm -hmm. uh, i mean do i think Tesla is overvalued. I think it's crazy. I think the evaluation of Tesla is absolutely insane, to tell you the truth. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Uh, would I short Tesla if I see a uh, classical chart pattern? No way. No way. Uh, will I buy Tesla if I get a buy setup in a second? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, uh, let, let's move on to the to the TAN ETF, which which encompasses some of this narrative that you're talking about. Um, but it, it's it has had quite a run itself. You know, I, I see it down well below. Um, was it down you know, 20, 20, something yeah. like that in, yeah. in March and and up well over 100 at this point. 
you've made you've made more money buying tan at the bottom maybe than you made buying bitcoin yeah you know well no not that's not the case but nevertheless we've seen a play on you know alternative energy i mean that's been a big play um you know of course the story there is we're going to have a new administration this administration that uh, wants to hug trees and outlaw carbon and you know we're we're going to see a play in any form of alternative energy and that and that's what's happened and uh, i think quite frankly it's probably overpriced itself uh in, compared to what is going to become reality uh you know we can talk big about you know where all the energy space is going but it's been a good play uh and we've seen other i mean it's not the only one we've seen a number of other similar uh stories like that uh and so, you know, solar, alternative energy, electric cars, all of that sort of thing. So that's that's what's going on. And, you know, you know uh, I'll be alert for those. If I see patterns, I don't I'm not I'm not a big bull on solar. I mean, I'm not a big bull on solar. Uh, I'm not planning to put solar in my house. I'll probably buy a Tesla. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to see and people need to be alert for setups like that that can offer great swing trades. OK, what about uranium? It's not in, in a sort of major breakout, uh, at least on the long term chart, as compared to, say, Tesla or TAN. And it's really the, the redheaded stepchild of the green energy trend. Uh, uh, I, I'm interested to hear, you know, what you have to say about it as as somebody who is a, a chartist. Well, I mean, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm going to speak as a global citizen. Um, I, I think it's crazy that the United States has missed out on on this. There's, yeah, you, you know, nuclear power is clean. Yeah, it's had safe, but but the technology today for nuclear power plants is not the technology that we've seen. Uh, give us problem in the past. Is there always risk with nuclear power? Of course there is. But I think that we're, uh, you know, the reality is it's a clean source of energy. It, it, it doesn't pollute the atmosphere. And so I, I think, will there be sanity by the U.S. to re-embrace nuclear power? I certainly hope so. Of course, Europe did, and Europe's kind of drifting actually away from it now. But uh, China's embraced nuclear power. And the, the problem is, is American technology was left in the dust because nuclear power became uh, the hated stepchild of the United States political powers that be, as well as the environmental industry. You know, even the environmental industry that's crying for clean power hated nuclear energy by and large. Uh, and so I, you know, I think that we will see a turnabout here at some point in time. I hope so. I think nuclear power is is a common sense way to go. I think that technology is there for so safe nuclear power. And if there is a trend back to nuclear power, certainly uranium uh, will be a good investment. There, are, fortunately, are some uranium. Future, they're not the most liquid in the world, but but they're tradable. And of course, we've seen uh, we've seen a lot of these rare minerals. We've seen some rare minerals ETFs that have done extremely well. And so, I mean, I think that's a place to continue to look. I, I you know, is is nuclear? I, it's had a run. I'm not prepared uh, to actually even be long in that space right now. But I think it's a space that I kind of have my eye out there on the edge and say. You know, I'm going to be aware of opportunities that come from that from that uh, part of the world. Okay. One final chart that you brought with you today that I would like to get to is the the BDRY break wave shipping ETF. Uh, so it looks to me, based on what I see from the chart, that, that you probably are, are, are bullish on on shipping. Um, and then I want to get into some questions. We got some great questions just about trading. Um, yeah, I, I mean. Hey, COVID created disaster to global commerce. I mean, that that that's the reality. It shut things down. I, I mean, you know, all of a sudden the ports are filled with chips and ships and the ocean's empty. 
And so, uh, you know, we will return to normal. i shocked that we are where we're at right now, but that's a whole nother debate, how the world has responded to COVID. But, uh, and so, you know, shipping, shipping companies, uh, the shipping industry stock got, got clobbered uh, because the bottom fell out, so to speak, from the shipping industry. So I think that'll come back. And so I, I think uh, it, it's a space that I have some ownership of. It's a space that I'm interested in. Uh, I'm hearing from people who are in that industry. And, and I hate saying, oh, somebody, somebody in the industry told me to belong, so I'm going to belong. I mean, I don't do that. That's not me. But when seeing people that I consider to be intelligent, informed, tell me that they think their industry is a poised for a good run, I'm certainly going to look at the charts and say, what can I find that support what they're saying that makes sense to me, that give me the trade that I want with the risk management I want. So that's that's where I see that right now. Okay. Well, Peter, thank you so much for running through all these different assets and you know, your reputation precedes you. So we did get some questions about um, how to trade charts. And John wants to know, in your experience, how successful are patterns, especially those with horizontal boundaries like head and shoulders, right angled triangles, on lower time frames like hourly um, charts compared with longer term charts like weekly and daily? Not reliable. I mean, I mean here, here's the reality is that charts morph. You know, you see something that you think, okay, this is what I'm looking at, and it has a way of becoming something different. And the reality is that one minute charts morph more often than five minute charts, more often than 10 minute charts, more often than one hour charts, more often than two hour charts, more often than six hour charts, more often than daily charts, more often than weekly charts. And so, uh, it, 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 there, there's, there's two parts to this answer. One is, you just have a lot more unreliability as you go down the time scale. Does that mean there are not trades that take place on the lower time scale? Of course, that doesn't mean that. There certainly will be times when you see a pattern on an hourly chart and the pattern works. More often than not, you can say, especially if that pattern occurs in a trend and you think it's going to reverse that trend on a lower time frame, more often than not, it's going to morph and it's going to resolve itself in the direction of the dominant time uh, trend in that time frame. And so I, I, I caution people against that, but that really raises a, a, a whole big philosophical question. And that is, do chart patterns predict are chart patterns an accurate, uh, a reliable way to forecast price? To that, I would say absolutely not. They're overrated. That chart patterns in and of themselves do not provide a big edge to a trader. I'm sorry, they don't. Now, I've made money trading charts for 45 years. So I'm telling you that as somebody who has been profitable by trading chart construction for 45 years, Chart patterns do not provide a significant edge in and of themselves. But I have to use something to determine when I'm going to buy and sell. I have to have some way to say I'm going to be long or I'm going to be short, I'm going to be in or I'm going to be out. Chart patterns provide for me a couple of things. They give me what I think is, they show me what I think is the path of least resistance. They show me levels where there has been support. And it'll suggest the opportunities where I might have an asymmetrical reward to risk trade. It's in that trade management where the edge has gotten. It's in risk management. It's in trade management. It's not in direction. It's more in timing. Because for a trade to be a good trade, it has to be right directionally and it has to be right tactically. And if it's wrong on either one of those, it's a wrong trade. And so that's what chart patterns are for me. It's just a way for me to pull the trigger and know where I'm wrong. Okay. Um, we got a question. As a trader, how do you deal mentally with losing trades and missed opportunities? How do you stay centered and focused and moving on to the next trade? Hey, um, my job as a trader, my mentor going back to the board of trade said, your job as a trader is to take losses. 
It's your primary occupation. You are in the business of taking losses because that's primarily what you're going to do. And my mental default position is my next trade is going to be a loser. That's the way I think. I have no problem. Negative Losing trades don't really affect me. They're part of the territory. I mean, I believe strongly that trading, at least my type of trading, is ruled uh, by Vilfredo Pareto, uh, an Italian philosopher and economist. And that is that, you know, it's the old 80-20 rule. 20% of your trades attribute 80% of your profits. I think for me, I know my numbers year by year by year. I know my credit level. And so it's not really 80-20 for me. It's more like 90-10 or 85-15. That, that what that means is out of 100 trades, 15% of those trades will produce my net, net bottom line in a year. That's been true for me year in, year out, year in, year out. Very stable. 15% of my trades produce 85% of my profits. Some years it's 10. Some years it's over 100. You know, 10% of my trades produce 100% of my profits. And so, but that's the reality. And so part of my job is to work my way through the losers to find the Pareto trades. I need a Pareto trade. I need to have 15% of my trades produce my profit. If I can't find those, then I'm in big trouble. But so, so losing trades are losing trades. They come with the territory. You know, it's, it's just it, what comes. Now, when I say a losing trade, not necessarily a losing trade. It could be a small winner. It could be something I have a profit and come back and get out at break even. It could be I end up taking my initial loss that I expected the loss in a day or two of the trade. But my job is to take losses. You know, cut my losses short and hopefully let my winners become Pareto trades. As long as they're winners, give them an opportunity to fulfill the predictions of Vilfredo Pareto. And so losses, losses are losses. Losses come with the territory. Hey, the markets, and I'm speaking to your audience, the markets don't know you people. They don't know where you live. They don't know the color of your hair. They don't know your personality. They don't take you personal. They don't know you exist. So why do you take a loss personally? It's not a personality defect. It's not a character fall. It's a loss, people. Losses happen. A lot of losses happen because you got to work your way through a lot of losses to find the trades that really are going to matter. Okay. That's my answer to that one. That That is a wonderful place to leave it. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time today, for running through all those charts, and for giving us a little picture into how you have traded for, for the last 40 years. Thank you very much, Miss. Always, always a pleasure to be with you guys. All right. In, until next time. Yep. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.